waste a lot of time, I just would like to introduce you James DeMeo, he's already in the pole position, giving us a nice introductory talk about Wilhelm Reich. It's all yours. Good morning. Okay, testing one, two, hey, that's good. Great. Beautiful morning. First, thank you so much, Jerry. Wonderful conference, and I appreciate the invite, and as always, and thank you to all of you for your kind words and attention. Um, one, an another small preliminary um, on the question of Wilhelm Reich and orbital energy and cloud busting. Um, this is really quite serious stuff, and yet if you go to Wikipedia or if you go on the internet, you're going to be introduced to the most god-awful collection of nonsense that you've ever seen in your life. So I just want to make that as a preface. Uh, Wilhelm Reich's work, you want to consult the original writings or websites that stick close to him, like my own is here, orgonelab.org, uh, and there are a few others, the Wilhelm Reich Museum, for example. So I just want to, a word to the wise, this is, no, uh, this is not unfamiliar to people who work in the water research either. So. Uh, my talk about restoring life properties to atmospheric water, a new method for ending droughts, I've been doing this, this is a been a major part of my work starting in the mid 1970s, and uh, this is Reich, the Reich cloudbuster. He made the discovery in the 1950s, based upon prior work that he did on the discovery of a specific life energy. He discovered life energy in living organisms. He called it the orgone to keep it preserved with the idea of organic or organism and uh, later discovered that there was a, uh, an expression of this life energy out in nature in the atmosphere, and later with experiments in high vacuum, he determined it also existed uh, probably in cosmic space as well. So uh, it's a very far-reaching set of ideas that he developed and got him into trouble with the Food and Drug Administration, as most of you know. He was attacked and had his books burned uh, by the food and drug people, um, but enough copies survived that there's been a resurrection of his work over the years. I'll just show you a couple of his uh, publications on the, uh, this weather issue, the atmospheric component of his discoveries. He did research in the Northeast United States ending droughts with his cloudbuster device, you can see him here, and also in the deserts of Arizona, proving that you could also use this method to green deserts. And his theory is, uh, is different from most of what I think is, is uh, commonly referred to today in, in mainstream science. Uh, he, his theory was more grounded on the old idea of cosmic ether. So he's talking about uh, this life energy that fills all space, much like the, the ether of space, and that it has a mutual affinity to water. This is very interesting. He says the orgone energy has a mutual affinity to water, meaning water is attracted to it, and it is attracted to water. And uh, all kinds of theoretical, uh, philosophical things come from that, but that's for a later lecture. Uh, he determined that the orgone energy had a negative entropy. It had a negative electri electrical charge. Uh, in, in higher concentrations, and that as it moved through the atmosphere, this is a fluidic kind of a thing, not a static, stagnant ether, but something that moved, like streaming protoplasm moves in, the, in, a, in an amoeba, um, that it drags the atmosphere along with it, creating wind. And also that uh, it, it had different states of excitation. It could be very excited and agitated, uh, or it could be relatively smooth and calm in a normal state, and then under certain states it could freeze and become stagnant and immobilized. So he talked about these different states of this energy more than just having discovered the energy itself. Uh, in, the, in the context of his weather research, 
uh, we look at the blue field of the atmosphere or the blue color of water as an expression of the orbital energy charge in the water. And I, I've given some presentations that give a little bit of legs to that idea uh, with my own water research. Uh, jet streams are, are produced by this theoretical understanding by streams of the orbital energy coming down from space and dragging the air along with it. This is a, an interface between the orbital energy itself and the material structure of the air. And this gained a big support with the discovery of the upper stratospheric winds, which are now seen blowing at the extreme edges of the Earth's atmosphere and then downward convecting energy into the upper part of the, uh, trop of the, of the troposphere. So there's all kinds of new discovery coming out in that area. Uh, at any rate, uh, let's just go on from here. That's, I won't, I've got a number of slides. I started doing this research in 1977 when as I was a graduate student at the University of Kansas. And uh, I was very concerned about drought and desert spreading and the big starvation episodes were taking place in Ethiopia and other places like that in the Sahel of Africa. So I thought, well, my gosh, you know, all these other efforts for greening deserts and, and so on have failed all for the most part. That failure was written over every single effort for stopping the advance of deserts. So this seemed like a natural, you know, you make a lot of rain and suddenly you overcome the whole issue of uh, stopping deserts because it, you just convert them over to something a little bit greener perhaps. Um, that's how I got interested in it. Um, I did work at the Geography Meteorology Department at the University of Kansas, and at first they were rather alarmed at my proposals, but they were open-minded. They said, okay, well, let's give it a go. Give it a try. And that's how I started getting into the, this particular line of work. Here's me when my hair was a little darker, more of it. <laughs> this is 1978, and I, this big instrument in the background, it's a cloudbuster that I built with a friend of mine who had a machine shop, and we went out there and we built this thing. And uh, I called it Icarus, it's the name of the Cloudbuster, Cloudbuster Icarus. And uh, we did, I did two years of work on that subject, 77 to 79, and, and uh, which I'm going to talk about here. It was, the field trials were held at the farm of Professor Robert Nunley. Some of you may know him, I, anybody know Bob Nunley? Very friendly guy, lively guy who uh, opened many doors for me at the university. And uh, the, the study itself was reviewed by the KU department faculty and to make sure I had a very good protocol so we could really determine what was going on with this thing. One of the protocols was a test for cloud dissipation. And uh, this idea is that, is that a, a, the aggregate uh, form of orbital energy in the atmosphere, it can, be, it can be stretched out and thin, in which case there are no clouds, but if it starts to bunch up or becomes a little wavy, then you get clouds growing in the, in the uh, inflection areas of, of this, uh, or the, the, the discontinuity regions of, of this uh, medium. And if you aim the cloud buster right at the core of the cloud, the idea is you're pulling the orbital energy charge out of it into the water in which the instrument is grounded, and then the cloud naturally dissipates. So if the orbital field is what makes the cloud and then it attracts the water to it to build up the charge. Uh, and what you see here is in this, uh, you see this, these are time-lapse photos about one minute apart. And after the fifth minute, we would flip a coin and decide whether to test or not test, but continue filming. And in this one, this is one of the test sequences. You can see the, the cloudbuster is aimed at that cloud right after this fifth minute. And you can begin to see it's already dissipating fairly quickly. And then we switch over to this other little one, and that's gone too. Uh, I did a whole series of these cloud dissipation trials, and, uh, and they confirmed what, uh, what we expected. <coughs> Whoops. I'll just show you a couple of things here. It, it didn't always show a clear dissipation, but sometimes the clouds would, would change in, in uh, patterns here, like. You, you couldn't look at, these are cross-sectional areas of the cloud which were digitized, so if you look at them, you can't really see too much, but when you graph it out, you can see something is going on that uh, right when the cloud buster is aimed at these clouds, they begin to change in their dynamics. I did a whole set of those photographs and 
Um, there was statistically significant evidence that these clouds were changing at that fifth minute, right after the fifth minute, as opposed to any other minute. Um, but I, I like clouds. I wasn't too happy about this painting. So I did also a, uh, a study on the uh, making clouds or increasing clouds. And uh, that's what you see here is a typical sequence uh, for about five, six hours of work on a particular day. Uh, there were 12 of these particular experiments were done. And, and you can see here the, ra the rather regular progression uh, ending up in nice Kansas uh, thunderstorms. And this is the data graph from all of the Kansas data, uh, either uh, 270 something stations for the whole state. This is uh, six stations with an hourly rainfall. And uh, what you see here is hourly percent cloud cover the, before the operations, three days before the operations, the day of operations, and three days after. And so you can see here the, the clouds have a natural pendulation on the 24-hour cycle. And then when the cloud buster is activated around noontime, in the middle of the test day, there's a disruption of the, or a, 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 a perturbation of the percent cloud cover. It stays up at higher levels rather than dropping down as it did previously. And you also get a nice peak in rainfall there with a secondary peak about two days later. So there uh, was pretty good evidence from this study. They gave me my, uh, my master's degree for doing that. And it was, uh, had a nice, simple title, Preliminary Analysis of Changes in Kansas Weather Coincidental to Experimental Operations with a Right Cloud Buster. <laughs> and uh, it's still out there. I, I actually published it as a little book, you can get it on Amazon if, it, if that sort of thing interests you. And it's interesting that the appendix document to this booklet got me in trouble more than the data itself. The appendix was called Evidence for the Existence of a Principle of Interconnecting, uh, Evidence for the Existence of a Principle of Interconnection in Nature. Uh, in other words, that there's something that connects other things together in nature. And uh, so I, I gathered together all kinds of evidence there, and I happen to mention that it if this is true, then Einstein can't be true. His, his whole thing about anisotropy in space would be blown apart. So that got me in big trouble with the physics department. <laughs> there we go. Now, the, the next thing I did was in 89. I, I kicked around for about 10 years teaching in the universities and uh, got in trouble every time I opened my mouth about this. So in about 1988, 89, I quit the university system and went uh, private with my own institute. But before I did, I got some funding from a few friendly people and went out to the, the deserts of Arizona. Come on. Oops. And um, tested this out on five pre-announced days. Dates, and they were about a month separated. And the study area was a very large area of uh, Southern California, Southern Nevada, and all of Arizona. Uh, because the prior work showed it worked over the whole, had effects over the whole state of Kansas, so this was not an unreasonable study area. And uh, they were announced to the Federal Office of Weather Modification, which was a part of uh, National Weather Service at the time. And uh, so I went out there and I did these operations, just a few hours of work or a day of work uh, once every month, approximately, I set up near Blythe, California. Anybody ever been near Blythe know what, what a desolate area that is. And I'll point out something here. Here's the atmosphere in the typical pre-operations condition. You, you notice that there's this obscuring haze. And here's the situation after the operations. Here, you can see this little mountain here. Is the same one here, just to give you a nice contrast. And that kind of clarification of the atmosphere was uh, something that Reich noted very early on. He we talked about the stagnated quality of the atmosphere in the desert regions. This is something that the classical meteorologists would call the atmospheric inversion layer, and it's known to block uh, the development of clouds and, and rainfall. So what was being observed is that this inversion layer phenomenon or the haze layer, uh, or the stagnant orgone layer, as Reich would call it, 
uh, was being um, dissolved and made more motile and transparent by using the Cloud Buster. And I can't for the life of me figure out how that could work if it's 100% composed of dust particles or aerosols. But if it's an energetic phenomenon and somehow the energetics of it are changed in ways that we don't quite understand, then, then the, the clarification of the atmosphere would make some sense. Uh, at any case, once this was done, we would see increases in cloud cover and rainfall over this whole large area. <coughs> Here's another picture of the atmosphere. Again, this, this haze layer go, goes up to something like about 2,000 feet in the Arizona deserts. Uh, here you can see after working a few hours, it's clar clarified. You get this, these high cirrus marking the intrusion of the jet stream into the area. And here's the analysis of the five operations put together uh, for those 424 weather stations, uh, the, the uh, daily rainfall amounts. These are the 15 days before. This is the day of the operations for all the operations combined and averaged together. And here's the 15 days after. You can see there's a basically a doubling of the rainfall quantities for about a week after these tests were made. And uh, this really confirmed Reich in a big way. And I thought, my gosh, you know, I, I, uh, this is going to open it up quite a bit more, and uh, there'll be some uh, greater interest. And uh, the results were kind of interesting that uh, the NOAA Office of Weather Modification uh, subsequently claimed that they had never been sent any of the documentary telegrams or anything that I had sent them over the years, which they had stupidly sent me letters saying, thank you very much for your materials. <laughs> so it looks like they just burned everything or threw it away, which is, by the way, a criminal offense. It's a felony to destroy government documents. That's something I learned. Anyway, they later denied having been sent anything. And the Air and Land Society, which is the premium group dedicated to arid lands and the problems of people living in arid lands, they, uh, when I gave my presentation on this, they scheduled me on the very last day of the conference, a um, special session when everybody else had gone, and I, it was me and one other guy who was presenting, and we, our, our girlfriends, and nobody else was there. <laughs> I can laugh about it today, but it's, it's really tragic, you know? Uh, so there was no official interest uh, at all. Uh, Israel operations were done subsequently, 91, 92, uh, under a condition of three years of acute record-breaking drought. Uh, conflict potential was very high over water resources. This was funded by a private initiative, but we got full permissions from the Israeli government, uh, and they actually sent a representative from Mikaroth, their hydrology department, uh, to, uh, to sort of cut red tape and get us uh, access to places where we could set up around the country. And uh, worked ten different, ten days at different sites from the northern to the southern parts of, the, of Israel, and the results were really quite spectacular. Uh, here is the uh, stagnant haze, and in this case the haze layer goes up to about five or 6,000 feet. And that's typical during the um, Saharan Desert fringes. And again, this is something that's quite obvious and repetitive in terms of its uh, where you'll find it under drought conditions or desert conditions. This is getting close to the Dead Sea. This is Lake Kinneret before any operations were done. That's the Sea of Galilee. And here's the instrument. It's a, it was a fairly simple thing we built while we were there. And uh, this dotted line you see here, I'll, I'll reference that momentarily. This is the Jordan River, or what was left of it at the time uh, because of the drought. Extremely low flow. This is using the device, setting it up. And here you can see this has been working for a couple of hours. You can see the so this area in front of, in the front area looks relatively good. Notice this little dock here, I'll reference it. That's about two meters of distance there, a little bit more. And after a few hours, you begin to see on the other side of the, uh, the other bank of the, of the Canaret begins to show up. And we also worked on the Dead Sea and the Red Sea near Ilat. 
And ab about six days after the work started, this rather large uh, cyclonic storm formed in the eastern Mediterranean and started moving eastward and amplifying as it moved. Usually what happens is by the time they get to around Italy, certainly by the time they get to Greece, they begin deviating off to the north, east, and therefore leave, leave the eastern Mediterranean in a condition of drought. In this case, it went straight east and arrived on the coast of Israel and brought record-breaking rain, uh, which they had not seen in many years. Um, here you can see a percentage of rainfall for uh, a map for that epoch of November 27th to December 7th, 1991. And, uh, and they called it the biggest rain in 50 years. This is from the same time period in the Jerusalem Post and so on. So I thought, well, wow, this is going to open the doors to uh, people's eyes will be open and this is going to be great. You know, we'll, we'll get a project going. I had a project outlined for them to green the Negev Desert. You know, go to the Negev Desert, green it, make plenty of rain for everybody, not just the Israelis, but everybody, you know, farm and agricultural will boom. Everybody will be uh, peaceful and happy and uh, other naive ideas I had about that. but. Uh, what happened was, is the, uh, oh, oh, let me finish here. Yes, here's the February 92. We went back a few months later. You can see the, the dock area. It's right, uh, the water has risen up by a couple of meters. Uh, maybe that doesn't seem like much if you look at Lake Mead. You know, a couple of meters is something, but it's not a great deal. But for a small country like Israel, that is a big deal. Uh, and they have been using every pump they had to pump water into the groundwater. Tiberius on the Sea of Galilee almost flooded, so they had to open the Degania Dam to let fresh water go down into the Dead Sea, which is an unheard of thing. They don't really do, really do anything like that. And they even removed the fish nets because it was inhibiting the flow of water because they didn't want Tiberius to flood. So the Dead Sea got a big shot of fresh water and uh, Lake Kinneret filled and all the reservoirs underground were being pumped and uh, there were out in the Syrian desert, there's wildflowers blooming and old dead trees came back to life. All kinds of interesting things. I wrote it all up uh, in, a, in a report. And here's the Jordan River. Here's that dotted line I referenced earlier. And uh, the landscapes all greened up very nicely. Record-breaking rains across the Negev, Syrian desert, snow seen for the first time in living memory of the mountains around the lot, uh, fields of wildflowers, uh, and so on and so on and so on. And here's the uh, Israel rainfall data from their 13 stations average. These are their official records. And you can see that here's the time period of our operations, and then you get this pulsation of rains coming in. This is like a heartbeat, Wright described this natural pulsation of rains like a heartbeat. And it's not, this is not a device that you use on a permanent basis. It's like acupuncture, you know? You, you get, it, get something moving again and then you stop. And if you get it going, it's like a natural heartbeat. It just keeps going on its own. Uh, the official reactions were they, they said that uh, it couldn't be cloud busting because uh, Mount Pinatubo had erupted on the other side of the world six months earlier, and that was the reason. I'm serious, that's what they said. And uh, I subsequently did work uh, analyzing uh, or re reading somebody else's paper on uh, weather conditions globally after Mount Pinatubo erupted. And globally, the world cooled off a little bit. Uh, and dry conditions were more global after Mount Pinatubo. So I, that's really ironic that the only place that got really uh, exceptional rains uh, during that same period after Mount Pinatubo was in Israel, but they somehow came to the opposite conclusion. So that was in 91, 92. Then there was another uh, project. I'm going to rush through this because I'm run, running out of time here. This was a five-year project that was funded by the government of Eritrea. And uh, Eritrea is this little country in the area of the uh, Red Sea, eastern part, northeast corner of, uh, near the Horn of Africa here. And uh, it's a very high elevation. Here's the road from Asmara, Eritrea, down to Masawa on the Red Sea coast. 
And uh, it's a very rugged area, people subsistence agriculture in the hinterlands. And again, this stagnant, stagnant, hazy quality dominated everywhere. Worse than I had ever seen it in my life. And this was where we were headquartered at the uh, Agricultural Research Center in Mount Samara. They, again, they opened their doors to help us in every way possible, uh, although we had very minimal funding just for our expenses, basically. We constructed a device there, took it out into the countryside periodically. We would stay in Asmara, go out on these expeditions lasting a day or two or three, and then come back. And this is one daily sequence, typical. Uh, we would set up a, a big reservoir like you see here. This reservoir is actually down by about four meters, four or five meters down from what it should be. About two hours later, you see the, 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 the rainfall comes back and then begins to kind of navigate itself towards where the cloud busting instrument is located. And uh, you get these rather good, good rainfalls. And uh, this is typical of what they're accustomed to in these areas. A, a good, they called it deluge. When they were saying, oh, we, there was a deluge, and I was, I was shocked. I said, oh my gosh. Oh, no. He says, no, 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 we like this. We like this. This is what we need. <laughs> so uh, it was their word. And uh, they were quite happy with it. And the older Eritreans said, this is like the rains we remember from 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, there was a huge drought. I mean, there was a drought across most of the Sahil that lasted from around 1962 to uh, 1994, which is when we did our first year of work here. And uh, again, I'm going to rush through this. This is, again, five years of work, so I can only give you some selected things. But this shows you the configuration. Here's Eritrea. This is the moisture flow. It comes from the Gulf of Guinea, way down over here in, in uh, West Africa, it flows north like so, and uh, and then it gets in, then it gets into the uh, Nile River drainage basin. So the and from here it would get caught up into the tropical easterlies, which would blow the rain across this whole area. So there was a very good enriching rain, not just for Eritrea but for the whole region. Here you can see one typical satellite image. Eritrea is somewhere right in here. And uh, this is the rainfall precipitation index for the Sahel produced by the National Climate Data Center. And uh, here we have 1994, the first year of our rains, our operations, and it was the first year of normal rains, above normal rains, in quite a long time. So here's this 30-year drought period that they had suffered through, and then we, we did our work at that point. And uh, the biggest result we got was in 1998. Actually, it was predicted to be an El Nino year, so uh, we, drought was anticipated for the whole Horn of Africa. I said, well, maybe we better build more than one of these instruments. We built three of them in total and put them out into the field. They were coordinated in operation by radio telephone. Uh, and I had a couple of teams of native workers who would uh, do what I told them to do. Uh, I just had to give them the orders, and they, they were judicious in carrying out things, and the rainfall in, the, in that particular year, the, these huge peaks is something that they have not seen in a long time. You get these huge peaks in rainfall. The normal, even with the cloud busting, the normal rains weren't quite that much as what we had with the three different instruments employed. At any rate, after, uh, after the five years of work, uh, we were not able to get rainfall data for a couple of those years, 1999, for example, and the 1994 data was not fully available in a daily organized form, so we only had about three of those years put together in this data analysis. But you can see here that the this is uh, aggregate of, of six different epochs of, of, of work. This is the date when we would start working. Here's the 15 days before, 15 days after. You can see that the after period has an increase in rain of about 50%. And uh, the probability coefficient on that is pretty good, about 0 0.0042, which is not bad. And uh, so I was very happy with that. Uh, unfortunately, with all the bounty rain, uh, their, their food supply imports reduced, so they were growing a lot more food and everything, and uh, unfortunately all the governments of the area started pouring money into weapons, 
and they started buying bombers and tanks and machine guns and bazookas and God knows what else. And the next thing you know, they're in a big shooting war with the Ethiopians. And bomb, Ethiopian bombers are bombing the uh, Asmara airport. All the NGOs are running for cover. And uh, so I, I told my team, I said, that's it. We can't, uh, we're driving around with this thing that looks like it's got tubes and you know, some guy in an Ethiopian jet is gonna see us and <laughs> come down and drop a bomb on our head. And I said, forget it, let's go home. So we, we were, uh, the country then went Stalinist. That's another lecture on that alone. Uh, so 1999, last year, I went there all by myself. I did a little bit of work, and then we went home. And, but the big rains continued and for another couple of years. And we were so depressed at this result. My God, five years of work, I thought it would open up again, you know, and, and again, uh, a, a result socially that was uh, going to close down any possibility for further research. But then this unbelievable thing happened. This article about new lakes in the Sahara appeared uh, in, the, in the San Jose Mercury News. A, new, a change of biblical proportions is washing across the Sahara Desert. For the first time in 6,000 years, new lakes have risen from the sands of southern Egypt. Nile River, swollen by unusual rainfall, is spilling over the reservoir behind the Aswan High Dam. As expected, the water flows through an arroyo into the overflow lake, but the deluge has continued and three more lakes now unexpectedly dot the desert. And I was just flabbergasted by this, but in looking at it, it wasn't quite so uh, unbelievable after all. Here you can see these overflow lakes, which appeared starting approximately 1998-99 when we were doing that big result with three different cloudbusters. It says the lakes hold about 700 billion feet of water, one quarter of the Nile's total water flow, okay? uh, annual flow. Anyway, here you, this is, I showed you this earlier. Again, the moisture that was raining down in this whole area of the uh, Horn was flowing down the Nile, and that's where it filled the Lake Nasser for the first time since it had built, been built in the 1968, I believe, was when it was first opened up. So. Here is a NASA image from October 2000. Uh, it had been a little bigger uh, in 1999, but, and I show you the 99 images flashing there. Uh, so the major Nile flows began during this project, this five year project, particularly in 1998, continued through about 2001. Here we are today, 2015, they're, they're drying up, they're almost gone. So this is a somewhat depressing thing about the, the lack of it catching fire, so to speak, in the social consciousness. But on the other hand, it's a hopeful message of the possibilities, my God, the possibilities. Um, here's Asif al -Hapti Michael, the head meteorologist for Eritrea Civil Aviation. He opened a lot of doors for me, for our team. Uh, that's me again, and uh, I, I want to thank all the people who helped us in that project. Uh, even though none of them are here, it was a multi-person project, and I thank you all very much for uh, listening. Thank you very much, James. You still would have one minute left, but... It's a perfect land. <laughs> um, may I take the privilege to ask the questions first? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> since I have the mic. Uh, how do you determine whether it's cloud busting or cloud generating? Number two, this year is forecasted a linear year, so could it be a tool to modify that? Uh, well, because the Normally, in, in weather modification experiments, they, they select a control area and a test area, and then you can compare the two. But the effects of this are so widespread, we cannot do that. So what we do is we set up a before versus after scenario. And so I, all I can do is point to the result after has been almost systematically like what you see here of uh, large increases in rain, usually slightly above the normals, that follow the operations and uh, 
you know, I have to, so I have to go on the track record, and uh, I can't really answer too much beyond that. So, El Nino. Uh, gosh, well, I suppose it, it depends. Uh, I'm trying to get a big project going in California for the last four years, but I, it's deaf ears mostly to it. So, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jim, um, as, as I, I presented uh, about the Earth's negative charge, and so if you have something connected to the Earth with heavy wires, as you do, and pointing up, it's kind of like a lightning rod that that is connected to a big source of negative charge. And so, you know, because charges tend to accumulate at sharp points, I, I, would, I would imagine, not, not sure, I would surmise that at the tip of those rods, you might have a huge negative charge. And if so, that would induce positive charges from the atmosphere to gather ground. Do you think it's possible that that, I mean, those are logical steps, that the, the gathering of positive charge may, may have something to do with, with the coming of rains? It certainly is something that ought to be tested, but I'll tell you, when, this question came up early in my work, and uh, the, the arguments uh, for a lightning rod type of effect seem extremely limited in terms of distances. But again, we're not grounding to Earth with uh, pointed metal it's, it's hollow metal tubes grounded in water. So there's some, and it has to be living water. I've tried this in stagnant water where you have dead fish floating and it doesn't seem to work. You have to have some vital, lively kind of water. And who knows, maybe this is part of the easy question as you've been researching, that lively, vital water with a blue color. Who is it that showed that wonderful picture of the lake, of the, the area in Finland with this blue glowing lake overflowing with thousands of gallons of water? That's the kind of water that it really works well in. Yeah, that would have negative charge, I suppose. Yeah, I would think, yeah. I'm a little bit... I'm a little bit confused about the time frames. Um, first, you pointed out that um, it is like acupuncture, that you, it's a single use, uh, it's a single treatment, and then on the Eritrea example, you spoke about five years of work. Yes. So what is the time frame for okay. the single um, intervention, roughly? Well, the, uh, the work in, uh, in Israel, for example, started and 10 days later, we were finished, and this big rain came afterwards. Uh, in Eritrea, we went there twice a year, uh, one time in early, mid-June, I believe, and later in, uh, in early September. So we would work it there again for a few days and then get the, the results would start to come. So each of those two epochs each year uh, were showing this kind of uh, increased pulsatory and rainfall activity afterwards. So it's, it's a couple of days? Within a couple of days, yes. Starting. So, any further questions? Yes. Uh, at the beginning, the first two things you showed, where first you um, broke up some clouds, where first you broke up some clouds, and then you formed some clouds. I was wondering what what you do differently between those two cases to decide which results you're going to get from the... Well, the, the dissipation trials are fairly simple. You just uh, find a cloud that meets the criterion of isolated cumulus and aim right at it and follow it and track it and you get this result. Uh, for the bringing rain, it's, uh, it's more complex. It depends upon local climatology, meteorology. Uh, it's different in every location, so you have to have some... I, my study at the university was in the Department of Geography and Meteorology, so I had a lot of background knowledge in uh, weather science to, uh, to gauge the classical kind of parameters and then integrate that with what Reich was, was saying. So. 